Hi, I'm Ann Holmes from the University of Maryland College Park. We want to welcome you to a special edition of YouTube Tuesday. December YouTube Tuesday is brought to you by the University of Maryland in celebration of Tony Lawson's retirement. Hello, I'm Adam Grant uh, from the Division of Research here at University of Maryland, and I'm joined today with Tony Pucciarella, uh, Director of Operations at our unmanned aircraft test site here at the University of Maryland. And for this uh, edition of YouTube Tuesday, we actually have a, something special. We have show and tell items uh, to bring. And, and these will probably look pretty familiar to most of, of you all. Um, these are examples of unmanned aircraft, uh, more popularly known as drones, which are quite literally a buzz around campuses across the country and probably potentially in your backyard or local park. These things are, are flying everywhere and growing in popula popularity due to the increase in technology and, and the reduction of costs are making them much more widely available. Um, and they're also particularly interesting in the research perspective because there's just so many things you could do with these aircraft. Um, yeah, everything from filming athletic events to um, crop monitoring to have any other uh, examples? Infrastructure, you know, monitoring power lines, pipelines, uh, like you said, agriculture, uh, law enforcement, emergency services, those are some other. So just so many applications for these things. And what may come as a surprise to some of you is even this little two pound, almost toy-like drone is regulated by the FAA. You can see the FAA tail number here. It is regulated as if it were an actual aircraft because the current set of regulations for drones, um, or for, excuse me, aircraft, um, define aircraft as, as virtually anything that can, can fly and is operated by a, a, um, a person, right? That's correct. Uh, so you see these everywhere, and I think most people don't realize that they're actually a regulated aircraft, uh, which requires a private pilot or someone with a pilot's license. Uh, they have to have an airworthiness certification, um, and they have to, did I miss anything else there? No, that's pretty, pretty good. You have to have permission from the FAA, the airworthiness certification, and the pilots have to be certified. Right. So there's a, there is a caveat to that, which is that people that are flying these uh, for hobby purposes, uh, there is an exemption within the, the federal aviation regulations for hobbyist operating models under very specific uh, parameters, um, which would include, you know, below 400 feet uh, in an uncongested area and an airspace that doesn't have any restrictions. So that's why, um, you know, a typical, you know, enthusiast of aircraft can, can take this and fly it legally. Uh, problem is, as soon as you start operating it for something other than a hobby, let's say a business pur purpose or university research, for example, uh, you lose that hobbyist exemption and all of a sudden you fall under the uh, regulations of the FAA, which uh, for those following drone regulations is an actively dynamic set of regulations that are, are changing to, to deal with the fact that these aircraft are becoming more and more popular. Uh, they're changing so fast that it's, it's hard for a compliance uh, guy like me to even follow the, the pace of change. And that's why I brought our resident expert along, uh, Tony here, to, to talk about uh, some of the scenarios uh, or, or restrictions associated with these and what uh, you need to be aware of in the university setting if you, if you do want to fly these for research purposes. So Tony, would you mind just kind of sure. giving us an overview of uh, the current restrictions and, and what conditions you, you do need or, or authorizations to actually sure. legally and legitimately operate these? So uh, what you did was a great summary, and what I'll do is just kind of add a little more detail to it. Um, everything we do in aircraft, we either have rules for it with the FAA, uh, we have waivers. So the FAA is, uh, you know, a lot of folks think that they're very rigid, and they are because they have to watch out for everybody's safety. 
but they do allow waivers. So everything with unmanned aircraft, whether it's commercial, whether it's uh, public aircraft, DOD, anybody that's operating unmanned aircraft is operating them under a waiver because we don't have rules for these yet. So when you're operating something like this as a hobbyist, uh, you're kind of outside the rules, so it's maybe not such as a waiver. But when we operate as a university or when law enforcement or DOD, anybody operates these things, they're under waivers. So it's how you get into that waiver process determines, um, you know, you know, how, you know, the process and getting into those waivers is what changes based on the type of operation you're going to have. So we as a public university, uh, and uh, as, a, as opposed to private universities that don't have this access, as a public university, as, as part of the state of Maryland, we can operate as a public aircraft through the Certificate of Waiver or Authorization Program called the COA Program. So these actually have COAs uh, associated with them, and that allows us the, it's a waiver to the manned aircraft rules, and we're flying them just like Adam pointed out with the end number it's on there. That's no different than a general, general aviation Cessna end number. It's registered in the same way. If you went on the, the FAA's website, you'd see the 282MD is registered to the University of Maryland. And that, that code is specific to us, right? It, it's yes. not something that anyone... That's correct. It's specific to us, and we have multiple aircraft on some codes. So we have multi rotor codes such as this, and then we have fixed wing codes uh, for, for these systems. And what we brought today is just a small sample of what we have. We've got about 32 uh, vehicles uh, that we own, uh, the university owns with the test site. They range from, these are two of the smallest ones, uh, and then we go up to 180 pound, 20 foot wingspan uh, aircraft that we fly off prepared services at an airport. Uh, and uh, we did our first flight with that one back in December, uh, which was one of the first operations from a public airport of a unmanned system, especially a large one. Um, so we, we operate in different capacities, large systems and small systems. So we operate under that COA, the, the public aircraft COA system, no different than DOD does, the Department of Defense does. And when you do that, as a public entity, you have to have your own airworthiness process. So when it's test is produced, they have an airworthiness process that they follow with the FAA to become certified. Well, there's, you know, just like we said, with unmade aircraft, there's no process, so we had to create our own airworthiness process. And uh, that's one of the first things we did as University of Maryland before we uh, uh, you know, started flying as a test site. We created this process. And it goes through a rigorous review, even for something small like this. We evaluate the ability uh, for it to handle failure conditions, such as a loss of link. If we can't communicate with it, what's it going to do? Is it going to come home? Or is it just going to start pulling off into the uh, sunset wow. and cause damage? So, uh, How long does it take to get a co -op? Uh, it takes about three months, three to four months, depending on the complexity of it. For something small like these, when we did these, they were they were pretty straightforward codes. It took about three months. So, what if you're not a public institution like Maryland? Do you can you still fly these? What are the options for? So, what the uh, private FAA, school? Yeah, yeah, it's it's great what the FAA did about a year ago. Uh, they came out with this uh, process. It was actually part of the 2012. FA Remodernization Act, and there's a paragraph called 333, number 333, and they developed a process around that where commercial operators or schools that are, are private entities and operating as commercial entities can get into that COA process. So it was before it was just restricted to public aircraft. Now they've allowed commercial entities, not just universities that are private universities, but also uh, developers of unmanned aircraft that want to sell their wares to and demonstrate their wares for agriculture use, whatever use there is. The movie industry was um, uh, was very instrumental in making that happen. They were one of some of the first, what are called 333 exemptions. They were uh, one of the first groups to kind of spearhead that with the FA, and it was very successful. And uh, it's gone, it's it's developed. And what that allows uh, businesses to do is to fly small systems like these, less than 55 pounds, but they're even allowing some larger than that. They're allowing them to fly them at 400 feet below, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a great uh, it's a great thing because what it's doing is it's freeing up this uh, industry and allowing people to develop these things legally. Uh, there are lots of companies out there that are still doing it without permission, and uh, it's unfortunate, and uh, uh, it, it hurts the industry. Uh, but everything we do here at the university, and most universities, I think, are following all the rules. But here at UMD, we, we do everything by the book, and everything we do is a, a safe operation. So, yeah, absolutely. And is the FAA enforcing these rules? Yes, they are. And uh, in fact, just recently, uh, anybody in the industry was actually uh, supportive of this. Uh, they fined a company who is violating the rules uh, of $1.9 million. Holy cow. And uh, so they are. And they set an example. And uh, you know, for those of us that are trying to develop a very nascent industry and, and do research legally and within the FAA's uh, you know, reasonable guidelines, uh, we, we're kind of glad that they did something like that because it, it hurts us. If one of these things 
goes into a passenger uh, aircraft and causes somebody to get injured. We're all so it's, it's, yeah, it's exactly. And obviously, it's terrible for the individuals that could get hurt, but it's also bad for us in trying to develop these things. So, uh, as you've heard, there's a lot going on here. There's you know very specific regulations. Uh, there's there's safety concerns when you're flying these over people, uh, potential intense liability. If you can imagine, if you were to crash one of these at a sporting event, it could do uh, could do harm to people. So that's something that universities need to consider when they're contemplating flying these. Uh, another area of concern that I hear a lot in my my day job here is export compliance. Is you know are these regulated uh, under export regulations? And the answer is. Uh, most definitely, uh, but the, the regulations, uh, the aircraft here cover the full spectrum of regulations. Uh, this one here, the Air Environment WASP, uh, was designed for the U.S. military for special operations. And even though it's just a, a two-pound aircraft, uh, it comes under the most strict set of regulations called the ITAR, International Traffic and Arms Regulations. Um, which means that if you wanted to send this out of the country or uh, teach a foreign, you know, non-U.S. citizen how to operate it, you would need a license from the Department of State. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you have, uh, this is the DJI Phantom, uh, which anyone can purchase off the Internet for, I think, five or $600 these days. Uh, and as of this summer, the export regulations actually, due to export reform, move this from a category of commerce control over to the absolute least restrictive category, EAR-99. Uh, so any, any small quadcopter that uh, has less than 30 minutes of endurance has a very uh, low level of export restriction. But as you see, it could be the whole spectrum. Uh, you also have people attaching special sensors to these aircraft that may have their own uh, set of export concerns that you have to be aware of. Uh, so these are all, all things that you have to look into as you're developing your position on, on flying drones on campus. Uh, I often get questions, just as an administrator here, from faculty that are interested in starting uh, to fly drones. And one of the first places I send them is to the FAA's website. They have a Q&A on drones that answers all these basic questions. If you Google FAA drone q and it'll come right up. And it's a perfect uh, resource for administrators to send out to your faculty investigators and give them just the most basic overview on the regulations. Uh, so that's what we had for today, and uh, thank you very much.